sing, 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 sing. Everybody start to sing. La di da, ho ho ho. Now you're singing with a swing. Do 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 Welcome to this special edition of Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. This episode is the second in our eighth season of month-long programming celebrating Italian-American heritage and culture. On this edition of Italics, Honorable Natalia Quintavalle welcomes us into the Italian consulate for our annual chat with the Consul General. We'll go on a brief tour of the Bronx Zoo during an in-depth conversation with John Calvelli, Executive Vice President of Public Affairs at Wildlife Conservation Fund and Executive Vice President of the National Italian American Foundation. Let's go to the Italian consulate in New York for our conversation with the Honorable Natalia Quintavalle. Let's start with the present. Three years, almost to the day, if I'm not mistaken, the beginning of September so, in 2011. Exactly. So here you are, three years, but these are three years of many other years that you spent in New York. Three different positions, a couple of them at the UN, and now as Consul General, and we'll get also later to the fact that the first woman Consul General in New York, which is a big deal because this is, I know, I'll, I'll say this so you don't get in trouble with your <laughs> colleagues, this is the Italian Consulate General of, of the United States. Correct. Yeah. What are your impressions after all this time? I feel at home uh, in, uh, in New York. I think it's uh, a wonderful place. Three years, so it was uh, gone in a while. Mm. Uh, it was really very, very fast what happened. Uh, United Nations was different uh, at the mission. Uh, there I was dealing with uh, universal issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, my colleagues uh, were my interlocutors from all over the world, which is a, a very interesting perspective. But uh, this time, as Consul General, I'm in New York. I met uh, so many interesting people. I did a lot, uh, both from the consular side, but mm -hmm. also meeting and working together with people from the cultural world, from the trade uh, world, uh, economy. My perspective this, uh, this time is very different. The three years uh, were very intense. I arrived in the middle of an economic crisis, mm -hmm. a crisis uh, which was touching especially Europe and Italy, but also the United States. And now uh, in the United States and in New York, uh, you feel that uh, you are in a way out of the crisis. There was a recovery, a clear recovery. In Europe, uh, I'm coming from Italy. I arrived two days ago, back to New York, and uh, you still feel that there is uh, uh, a recovery to go through. You also went through three different governments, so to speak, right? Three different prime ministers. That's one here. of the reasons yeah. why it was so intense. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All of them came here. Prime Minister Monti, Letta, and uh, we are waiting now for, 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 Renzi. Uh, for Renzi coming in the next days. So, uh, yes, it was really very intense for Italy and for us representing Italy abroad. It has to be a little bit disconcerting because you never know how they might we use the expression in English, reinvent the wheel. <laughs> right? And so you don't know what changes there are going to be and things of that sort. Yes, but uh, there is a certain uncertainty every yeah. time uh, you change. But uh, I have also to say that uh, the foreign policy, the Italian foreign policy, is very clear mm -hmm. designed. And uh, I think there are changes, there are uh, some adaptation to be done. But really, we have uh, a clear direction and uh, we don't suffer so much in the foreign policy yeah. from this yeah. point of view. You have been very active in the Italian or Italian-American community. We'll use the adjective Italian to talk about both of the communities. Uh, for me, they're the same, yeah. depending <laughs> on which adjective you want to use. But you've been very active in the community. Um, there have been some developments uh, culturally or linguistically, we might say, in the sense of the advanced placement exam. Mm -hmm. you, it's something you inherited also. Uh, it was a challenge and we're getting closer and closer, I think. Yes, as far as the AP exam, uh, we are in a very good, 
but at the same uh, uh, critical uh, position in the sense that uh, the number of people uh, who are ready to go through the exam uh, has increased steadily in these years and uh, we reached uh, a number that uh, which is uh, really encouraging for uh, reaching the target uh, we have for 2016. In a way we are relieved by the fact that uh, the things are going well at the same time, uh, we have to be careful because the target has to be met yet. Mm -hmm. We have really to keep the attention on, uh, on the study of Italian. And now that uh, with the AP we are in a quite good position, uh, we are looking to the other degree of, uh, of the process uh, to uh, learn Italian, which is uh, giving more attention to the elementary mm -hmm. school, and try to uh, increase the number of uh, young, very young students taking Italian as a second. And a lot of that is done through the Enti Gestori, and we should explain yes. that. These are American not-for-profits, 501c3s, that are, however, funded to some degree by the Italian government for the promotion of Italian language and culture, the largest one here in New York. Absolutely. We did a, a, a big work with uh, the embassy and the uh, consular network uh, in the United States, but obviously uh, the Osservatorio della Lingua Italiana and the local observatories, among the local observatories, New York uh, is the big one. All the three-state area is the area where the maximum of exam AP and uh, inscription in the uh, Italian classes is uh, maximum, really. I always like to think that out of this crisis of the AP, what happened was that the various, as you just mentioned, the, the embassy um, uh, or the various consulates really started to speak to one another in a direct fashion, not just during the ceremonial moments of the year, whether it's the 2nd of June or the 25th mm -hmm. of April or whatever, but actually getting down and dirty and working together. And I thought that was good because it, it, I've been in the teaching profession for a long time and I think this is one of the first times that there's really been a concerted effort at a national dialogue with regard to Italian. Absolutely. It was a big effort also in uh, trying and raising resources mm -hmm. for to right. support that. And uh, it's really thanks to the reaction, uh, the very positive reaction from the Italian, uh, Italian-American mm -hmm. community that we really did it. Uh, and uh, let's say we are trying to do it. Yeah. <laughs> What's been good is if you look at the history of it, yeah. there have been significant increases from year to year. And we are maybe 20, 20 students shy of, of our mm. goal. So that's good. We have two more years to yeah. do that. What are some of the other challenges that in, in this role the last two years that you've had? <laughs> Recently, as you know, for instance, and from the really consular point of view, uh, there was the closure of the uh, consulate in uh, Newark mm -hmm. covering the New Jersey. And uh, for us, uh, for the consulate to, uh, to try and to equip ourselves to be able to uh, tackle the issue of thousands <laughs> of right. Italian uh, that uh, were supposed to be served by and were very well served by the Italian consulate in New York uh, had to come to the uh, uh, New York consulate general and that was uh, a challenge for us but also for the community because they had to adapt to this new situation. Mm -hmm. I think that both from the community and from the consulate, the staff of the consulate which is uh, really wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, there was the good reaction. Yeah. Yes, and, some and critics uh, were sure, raised. Sure. But, uh, and let's talk numbers. In New Jersey alone, if I'm not mistaken, Newark was serving something like 15,000 yes, Italian uh, citizens who live 17, here, right? 17,000. And you here serve many more than that. I think people really don't realize what the consulates do. They think that just some diplomat comes in and sort of meets other diplomats, shakes hands, whatever, has lunch. There is a, an enormous part of our work, uh, which is to serve the community. Right. And with various services, uh, with the passport, uh, with the, uh, all the documents they need. And then uh, there is uh, in, another enormous job we do is they, they, they try to help people who want to recover Italian nationality, citizenship. Yeah. citizenship. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, really what we do. Then uh, we have also some other tasks right. to represent Italy abroad in the mm -hmm. cultural uh, trade uh, mm -hmm. and so on. 
and that we do, and we do it. And I think that also we had some challenges, and I still have a very big challenge because uh, since uh, Director uh, Viale of the Italian Cultural Institute left, I'm also the director of the Italian Cultural Institute. So uh, it's uh, another big, big right. challenge uh, uh, to manage uh, together these two big Italian institutions. We have also this part, uh, which is maybe in some cases more visible, uh, and uh, I think we did uh, good uh, things all together with what we call Il Sistema Italia, the Trade Commission, uh, with uh, the ENIT, mm -hmm. uh, with the Italian Cultural Institute, but also with the Italian uh, American Institution, mm -hmm. cultural institutions like the Calandra. Right, and or, others like Casa Italiana, NYU, NYU, NYU mm -hmm. or the Italian, Italian Academy. Academy and, uh, so uh, we really did a lot of things. Let's talk about some of the physical changes in the consulate because if someone hasn't been here in about eight or nine months, they would expect to see you on what we call the Italian first floor. And instead, you're no longer on the first floor anymore. And they would expect to see this room set up differently than how it is now. We tried to renovate the consulate, also the building. The building is a very important building. Is a landmark, so we decided uh, at a certain point that uh, we need to uh, put uh, that in evidence. What we call the first floor is now only devoted to uh, reception, uh, to events that we organize in the consulate. And I moved uh, from my beautiful uh, uh, office with the boiserie at the first floor to the fourth floor which is very beautiful mm -hmm. and it's some renovation also. It's not so prestigious as right. it was the Doesn't first floor. Doesn't have the heavy uh, hardwood, which had, right. Yes, and I think that's, uh, that's important. It's not only because um, I feel more comfortable at the fourth floor. It's because uh, we really want the consulate uh, as well as the uh, Italian Cultural Institute to be open and to let people to have, uh, to use it uh, for events, uh, for meetings, uh, for uh, uh, for the Italian, it, it must be something the Italians uh, who come to New York think they can use. We started by inviting some uh, uh, artists uh, to decorate uh, this room. Uh, we started with some paintings by Nunziante, then uh, we went through the sculpture of uh, Giorgio Miliani, and now we have this young artist, Teresa Cinque, uh, who did this uh, installation site specific mm -hmm. for the consulate. In Textiles this one, of trees yeah. on the wall. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And the name is uh, Velvet Park because yeah. this is velvet. This is velvet, yeah. Coming yeah. from Florence and Park uh, because yeah. we are on Park Avenue. You are the first woman to be consulate general in New York. Mm -hmm the consulate general par excellence in the United <laughs> States. You've paved the way a little bit, or that the assignment of you here has paved the way a little bit. We've seen some changes, I think, the last couple <laughs> of years in the Italian government. Leta uh, had made some changes, some yeah, progress absolutely. in that regard, in the gender, and now, of course, Renzi, he's actually 50-50. If you count his cabinet, you see there are, what, eight women and eight men. Well, I think that, uh, and I hope that it is not just like, by chance that I'm here, but uh, that's correspond to a change in the Italian politics uh, and the role of women in Italy. It's changing slowly, mm -hmm. uh, and from my point of view, too slowly, but uh, it's changing. And I'm really very convinced that uh, diplomacy is a work for women, mm -hmm. is a job for women. Yeah. Uh, in diplomacy, I think that uh, women can have a, a very, very, it's not only a question of equality, which is the starting right. point. Uh, we have to be 50-50, right. that's the yes. target. Uh, but it's also because, uh, really, uh, women in diplomacy, they did, uh, uh, in, uh, in many different countries, uh, no, right. no, not in Italy, a very uh, good job. In a male-dominated uh, uh, diplomacy, the result was not so good. Well, we think of India. We think of Israel, Golda Meir in Israel. In India, there have been, yes. there have been women prime ministers. We can argue about the, the, yeah, the sort of power that, 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 that German, the important. economic power that Germany is taking. But in Germany as well, and, and so um, there have been some excellent successes so in I'm female very happy prime that ministries. We decide yeah. to uh, improve from yeah. this point of view. Yeah. What happens to the consul general when 
he or she leaves. All the consul general from New York moved to a very important position. My predecessor, as you know, is now uh, the ambassador to Tel Aviv. In my case, uh, I have still one year. You have one year, so, so we're not rushed. Year There's no rush, year. exactly. <laughs> Since I'm coming from Rome, because normally we have two posts abroad, uh, one after the other, then okay. we go back. So this is my first post after, after Rome. I'm supposed to be posted somewhere else, probably as an ambassador to some mm -hmm. country. I don't really know which mm -hmm. one. I have some preferences, but uh, yeah. I keep it for me. You have another year left as the Consul General in New York. What are some of your challenges this coming year? There is a challenge uh, which is coming very soon mm -hmm. uh, and uh, is the uh, election for the renewal of the committees, uh, the committees of Italian oh, abroad. Yes. It will uh, probably happen in the month of December. The date is not yet uh, uh, decided, but uh, we are preparing for that. And that's, it's important anyway to renew uh, the representative of the Italian community. I think what people don't realize is that Italy is the only government that has senators and assembly deputati that would be representatives abroad. Mm -hmm. um, there are 18 outside of Italy, correct? That's correct, and uh, because we have uh, very different uh, layers of representatives of our community. One is the one we will elect, uh, is the, the committee. Comites. Then there is the uh, CGR, which is the council, which covers all the world, starting from the committees, from the different mm -hmm. committees. And then uh, we have uh, senators and uh, deputies elected abroad. Mm -hmm. Uh, among Italian who are living uh, abroad. Right. And this take in account uh, the big uh, Italian diaspora around right. the world. Yeah. So we yeah. have uh, some of them. There is uh, really a recognition of the importance uh, also in the Italian parliament and the Italian institution of our big, big community. Yeah. And that's very significant, I think, politically worldwide, you know, that Italy has this uh, official representation in that sense. And you're right, it does speak to the fact that from a political point of view, there's a uh, concerted attention given to the diaspora, whether the current immigrants or the children or grandchildren of, yes, of, uh, of the immigrants. And then uh, we have uh, in 2015, uh, and it will start before I finish my um, term here, uh, the uh, big uh, Milano Expo 2015, mm -hmm. the Universal Exhibition, which is really a, a very important event uh, which will take place in Milan, but uh, we will try and have all Italy uh, represented there and together with all the rest of the world. Right. In America, yes, we yes. call it the World's Fair. Uh, yes. Everyone else around the world calls it Expo. Expo, but right. it's, uh, right. it's it a is world a, It is the fair. World Fair. It's right. the World Fair. And there will be a very beautiful also American pavilion, yes. a U.S. pavilion there. And uh, I think uh, it's something that uh, all the Americans who are interested, not only in Italy, but also in uh, uh, understanding what is happening in the development of the world, the sustainable development of the world should be there. It's in Milan. It's in Milan from it, May to October. From May, it opens up this May. And so if people want to go, they should get on the phone and call their travel agents right away because the hotels are going to be... Absolutely, yes. and uh, taking in account that there will be special packages and facilities for Italian living abroad. We're glad you were able to take some time out of your busy day. We look forward to you coming to maybe one or two events at Calandra. Absolutely. And, um, and buon proseguimento. Grazie mille. <laughs> John Calvelli is Executive Vice President for Public Affairs with the Wildlife Conservation Fund, and he is Executive Vice President for the National Italian American Foundation. Let's join John Calvelli at the Bronx Zoo. Here you are in this position. You are involved in many things. You started out your career in Washington, D.C. You were Chief of Staff at a, a rather young and precocious <laughs> age for Elliot Angles. Yes. Um, and you were there for over a decade. Yes. And then you moved back to the Bronx. It's one of those great kind of American stories and it was one of those great immigrant stories. Yeah. My parents were both immigrants from a small town in Calabria, Vico Aprigliano, and they came here uh, literally to start a new life. And um, amazingly, in one generation, their children went to college. Um, I was a graduate of Fordham undergrad and Fordham uh, Law School. 
and uh, literally met then Assemblyman Elliot Engel on Morris Park Avenue for the opening of the Bronx Council of the Arts. We saw each other there. We met each other at the wedding of a mutual friend, a classic kind of Italian political story. Elliot Engel, who is Jewish, has probably been the best friend of the Italian-American community. Uh, his wife is Italian-American. And we literally kind of hit it off from the beginning. I was still in law school at the time, working for him on campaigns, um, helping to run his reelection to the legislature. And he decided to run for Congress in 1988. I ran the campaign and at the age of 25, went to be his uh, chief of staff in Washington, DC. And I will tell you, um, we live in a time when politics is the, the, just a term is so denigrated yeah. by society. And I will say that there are many redeeming qualities uh, in the political process. The friends that I've made, the ability that we had early on to make some real changes. Um, some of the things that I'm proudest of, the first bill that the congressman and I worked on was uh, designating October Italian American Heritage Month. Uh, and that was in 1989 and we had President George Bush, Bush one, mm -hmm. uh, sign that legislation. Uh, we worked on legislation dealing with the internment of Italians during World War II and the Storia Segreta, the unknown right. story. Uh, that was a piece of legislation that we worked on. And that legislation was finally signed. That took a while, right, to get that through? That took us four years. Congressman Engel worked with Congressman, then Congressman Rick Lazio. We moved it through the legislative process. It took us about two years to literally help educate people because people had no idea that over a thousand Italians were interned in Montana and more importantly the uh, restrictions that were placed on Italians on the West Coast and potentially even on the East Coast. Right. The things that saved us um, as I've learned from that experience was this whole situation where there were just too many of us and uh, General DeWitt uh, which they used to call General Dimwit, mm -hmm. but General DeWitt who would control the Western Command he was um, of the mind of putting all Italians in internment camps. So just incredible story, um, helped me reconnect with my heritage in a way that I had really not before. And in the process found that my, my grandfather was deemed an enemy alien simply because he was an Italian. Italian citizen. And, I, and that really helped open our eyes and uh, we passed that legislation and then, then President Clinton Clinton. signed it into um, uh, law. And um, one of the others which I think from a personal perspective was working with the, the Albanian community mm -hmm. and the Kosovar community specifically on um, literally the creation of this new country called Kosovo. Yeah. And uh, having gone there three times working with this community that has a very strong link to even to Calabria because there's a large Arbresh community right. uh, and Albanian, uh, Italo-Albanian community. Yeah. And just as a parenthesis, there is also a Calabrian association here in the United States uh, that is headed by a former congressman, Dio Guardi, yes, an yes, Italian, yeah, yes, yes. an so Italian American, who feels yeah. who feels actually more Albanian. Uh, <laughs> and 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 you know, and that's all of those experiences for me. That's what government can do. It can help educate people. It can help change policy. It can do good. And um, I have this conversation with my 15-year-old, and he's learning about government now. And um, I hope that this next generation realizes they have a real responsibility uh, to help change government, but also help change society in a positive way. And that's what government can do. How was it being a young Italian-American in Washington, D.C.? Here you are, you're, you're, you're a young chief of staff. Right there, that's got to be yeah. challenging as far as perceptions, you know, by some of the sort of older people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then here you are, Italian-American. Yeah. You're from New York. Yeah. I just want to go back a step because yep. my heritage came from my home. My father um, would say, you speak English all day, when you're in the home, we're going to speak Italian, which actually meant we're going to speak Calabrese. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> we spoke both. But Calabrese was really the lingua franca in the home. I had gone back to Italy, had studied in Florence uh, in college, and those experiences gave me, I hope, a better understanding of what it meant to be Italian and Italian-American. So I go to uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, literally one member of Congress who I had become very friendly with, who was from the South, asked me if my family was in the mafia. Yeah. He said, um, I said, no, <laughs> I'm just sitting there. I said, I said uh, Congressman, my, my father works for the Transit Authority. Uh, he's a car inspector for the Transit Authority. And my mother's a, as an executive assistant in a business. And he kind of looked at me and I, that, uh, I realized I needed to do some educating. Yeah. I went out uh, to uh, South Dakota take an urban member 
to a rural district, we were going to look at Sioux Valley. I'll never forget this, and I'm on this bus with these people from the community, leaders of the community, four o'clock in the morning, and we started off going from farm to farm and learning a little bit about what rural life is like, and uh, which I had seen much, much of that when I was in Calabria, but that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm there, and by nine o'clock, there's a, you know, you've been together five yeah. hours, there's a sense of connection, and somebody came to me and says, you know, I know an Italian. I said, oh, you do? <laughs> I said, yes, and uh, they're in the mafia. I said, really? She said, yes, yes, uh, they speak with their hands. And I just sitting there going, <laughs> What do you say? And I said, well, that's really not the, yeah. that means, et cetera. <laughs> and you realize that there's all these misconceptions out there and that we as a community, and shows like this, obviously give people a chance to meet and understand what being Italian, meet Italian American is understand what being Italian is. That led me really to re-engage in my community. I, I had been a founder of a group called Fieri, right. which was an uh, organization for young professionals. We should say Fieri means proud. Proud in yes, Italian. In Italian. Um, and uh, we had, I believe, 17 chapters when I left as national president. It was, um, it was really this expression of a new generation at its, at its time. And I then got much more involved with the National Italian American right. Foundation. I was ask you. And one of the reasons for that was I wanted to help dispel some of those stereotypes and also to try to make people understand the important role that Italy played vis-a-vis uh, -vis American policy. And people don't realize that Italy is one of our best allies and Italian troops have fought in Afghanistan, have fought in, I have been in Iraq, um, in Kosovo, in Albania, um, in North Africa. Uh, Italy plays an important role in promoting and supporting uh, U.S. foreign policy. We were then going through a kind of an interesting period where the U.S. was trying to promote the expansion of the U.N. Security Council, right. where Italy would have been marginalized. And that gave us an opportunity to really help educate people about that issue. And um, we started a, a lunch series on the Hill, on yeah. Capitol Hill. And uh, we would have over 100 people come monthly to hear from prominent Italian Americans at the time, Secretary Andrew Cuomo and others within the administration, people from Italy to talk about the situation uh, between U.S. and Italy at the time. And it was um, an eye opener. And many of those people have remained involved in the community and remain involved with the foundation. And that brings us to another uh, conversation about you, and that is you're in Washington. I'm assuming it was during that decade that you hooked up with NIAF. When we founded Fieri, we had worked with NIAF in the mid-80s to do uh, conferences here in New York on the Italian-American dropout and the need to promote Italian language and culture in, in the United States. And you worked your way up to be vice pre you're one of the vice presidents yes. of uh, NIAF. I always say that you're the person behind the scenes. <laughs> Not to take away credit no, from other no, people, no, I, well. but that your role is... Um, much more major than you make it out to be. So I want you, to respond yeah. to that because yeah. I think one of the things as a community that we need to do is to understand that uh, each of us plays an important role um, that we have had in our history people that have been il comandante, right. to not use other terms. <laughs> And uh, what we need to do is really to foster yeah. that democratic with a small d process yeah. where we build consensus and each of us then does what they can do to help right. move an issue right. forward. It's like a kaleidoscope with the different pieces exactly that, right. that make the image. And then you got involved in the Conference of Presidents yeah. of Major Italian American Organizations, which we should tell our viewers is a national organization of the presidents or directors or whatever yeah. titles they hold of major Italian American organizations. And that's where they came important. They were important for the U.S. Yeah. What happened there was I was asked to take over the group which at the time was called NIACA, the National Italian American Coordinating Association. And I realized having worked with other communities um, and uh, the Jewish community, the Albanian, many ethnic communities, I realized that what we needed was really a conference that would bring together the varying leaders of, uh, of our community across the country. So think of uh, a situation where we're bringing together the leader of Unico and Sons of Italy and the National Italian American Foundation and the Calandra Italian American Institute and others so that you have at least once or twice a year these individuals are getting together to try to help set policy and what are the consensus positions and what are the issues that we should be grappling with. Of course, um, over the years, um, I was chair for several years, and now it's, it's moved on and I think it's doing very well. We've tackled some 
very important issues. As you mentioned, one was the issue of the Security right. Council and Italy's marginalization. But since then, we've worked on uh, AP Italian yeah. and making sure that the uh, AP Italian language uh, exam would, would continue. And uh, I think one of the issues that we're going to be grappling with is probably going to also be um, the Columbus issue and Christopher mm -hmm. Columbus. Mm -hmm. But going back in 2009, uh, working with the State Department at the, at the request of Secretary Clinton, I helped to organize um, the relief effort for uh, Aquila. Mm -hmm. um, and the Abruzzo region. It's a real source of pride for me. I'm obviously Calabresa, my wife is from Abruzzo. I went there with my son and we, mm -hmm. and we saw, we used our resources to help the university get back up on the ground because Aquila, very much like some of the smaller college towns in the U.S., it's a university town. Right. And if the university is really the, the heart of that town and that city, and we worked with the university officials to help rebuild the campus. And they're still struggling with the Very center so. because yeah. those are four and five and 600 year old buildings yes. that you can't just retrofit. We actually built a brand new building yeah. because it was easier to do that than try to retrofit because right. many of the promises of reconstruction, it's years and years and years right. and they haven't been done. What we did was actually build a structure that was in keeping with the motif, but at the same time provided them with the resources and they're using it for international studies. And what better thing for us as right. Italian Americans Americans to have done is to help create that link and help those students. Yeah. And actually, uh, over 50 of those students came to the United States during the worst of the crisis there. Yeah. But this is what the conference does. This is yeah. what our community should be doing, coming together on issues of national and international importance to show support to our fellow Americans and to our, our brothers and sisters in Italy. The National Italian American Foundation engages in other activity that might be a little bit different from the, all the good work that UNICO and all mm. the good work that the Order of Sons of Italy. The National Italian American Foundation seems to me, at least my opinion, mm. is that it's the one that has the most direct line to the Italian government, mm. that is to members of mm. the parliament, members of the Senate, et cetera, et cetera. And a number of them are at the uh, annual uh, yes. gala. Yes, yeah. the gala is really an, uh, an expression of our community. And I think next year we're celebrating 40 years and it will be even more of an expression of our community because we'll be moving for the first time in 40 years and we'll actually have more space. And what, what we would love to see, and John Viola, our, our president, and I have really been uh, militating around this. We really feel it's important that the foundation and that weekend should really be a, an opportunity for the community to come together. And whether it's Unico or Sons of Italy or uh, name the group, some feely, doesn't matter. Yeah. This is an opportunity for you to come together, be with fellow Italian Americans, learn some of the issues, and enjoy our, our common heritage. Mm -hmm. This year, i um, very excited that we are working with John Torturo, mm -hmm. and uh, he will be coming down to receive one of our awards. But his award is actually based on his incredible work, but also the role he played in a PBS special that's a four-hour documentary on the Italian-American experience. I think it's probably one of the best pieces of work that will be on television about our common experience. Yeah. Uh, done by John Maggio, a documentarian from Brooklyn. Fantastic piece of work. We're going to actually be showing it and previewing it at the foundation. So it's one of those things we've been involved, but it's really uh, an incredible piece of documentary uh, work that we want to show the community and hopefully go back and say, make your kids watch this. Yeah. You know, learn about the lynching of 1891, or the incredible story of Frank Sinatra and his role in the Kennedy yeah. uh, election. The role or of the, enemy Cuomo, alien. The, or enemy the enemy alien, alien issue. So it's you, all yeah. in there. Yeah. I've got to tell you, having been involved in this uh, community for literally since, uh, since I was born, it was a, f I learned, and uh, we can all learn from it. Yeah. And Maria Lorino is going to be doing a companion book on this issue specifically. So it's going to be very, very exciting to watch PBS working with WETA, uh, which does the Ken Burns series. Yeah. Uh, so this is the quality that we're talking about. Uh, they've done the um, Latino experience and they've done the Jewish experience and now they're doing yeah. the Italian American experience. And it's different from the few things they may have done in the past about Italians because be before it was basically the singers or it was this yeah. or it was, there was a sort of theme there that was like the best of. Yeah. Things of the, here instead we have a more sober look at at the Italian history, I think, uh, in yeah. this country. I mean, to talk yeah. about uh, the, the crisis uh, of identity in our community in the 20s and 30s, and the role that we played during World War II, and then kind of post-World War II assimilation, and um, this issue of the specter of organized crime and the role that it's played in kind of distorting how we're perceived by 
uh, America. It's all tackled in there, and it's tackled in a very objective way, and in a way that um, I think should make us all proud, and hopefully will spur that sense of discovery right. that we really want to learn more about who we are and, and the role that we played in this country. Discovery and discussion. Exactly. NIAF, yeah. uh, Conference of Presidents, because I know you, it's not just those two days a week, the uh, year that yeah, you work yeah. for the Conference of Presidents, and it's not just the gala and no. maybe the board, quarterly yeah, board meeting no. with NIAF. But then you also have this day job. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the Wildlife Conservation Society was founded in 1895 by none other than Teddy Roosevelt and a group of progressive New Yorkers, the Boone and Crockett Club. They were actually hunters, and what people don't realize is that hunters can be your best conservationists, and they are your best conservationists because they are out in nature. They realized that there was a need to educate New Yorkers, there was a need to um, educate Americans about the importance of the natural world, and to save some of these vanishing species. Uh, at the time, it was the buffalo, a symbol of America. Yeah. There were 30 million buffalo, and by the time we were founded, there was less than 20 in the, in the, in the wild. Oh, wow. There were about 1,000 in gentlemen herds, et cetera, but I believe it was 21, to be exact, in Yellowstone National Park. So uh, we bred them here at the Bronx Zoo and released them back into the wild. So many of the bison, the buffalo that you see in your Federal Reserves, can trace their roots back to the Bronx. To <laughs> they're, they're all New Yorkers <laughs> at the end of the day. So these institutions were created with this idea of education um, and also to reach out and to save wild areas. So fast forward uh, 119 years, we work in over 60 countries and we manage five properties in New York. Yeah. Um, Bronx Zoo, Central Park, Prospect Park, Queen Zoos, and then the New York Aquarium. And we have collectively about 4.3 million visitors a year. It's very exciting for me because I was literally born on 180th and Hughes Avenue. I was born three blocks from here. Mm. And of course, sfacciato, I literally brought my photo from 1965 in front of the monkey house with my father. <laughs> I'm his little two-year-old with my brother, Lewis and myself and dad standing there on a cold wintry day because this was our backyard. I mean, this is where we came. This is where the excursions were. My grandmother would bring me here in the carriage. Um, this was in a way home. This was part of who we were. And this is how I learned about, I saw my first elephant. I saw my first bear. I saw my, my first sense of that there's a larger world. And that sense of awe and inspiration 119 years later, we're still, we're still doing it, and it's very exciting. We are right now in the um, heart of the Bronx Zoo. Uh, the Bronx Zoo, as you know, is the headquarters for this global conservation organization, the Wildlife Conservation Society. And we are in historic Astor Court. This was literally the beginning. The first building went up in 1899 when we opened, November of 1899. And this is the largest collection of Beaux-Arts buildings in New York City. And it's also an historic district. It's one of the few historic districts right here in the Bronx. And um, for me, um, this is where I came as a child. I, I have photos here uh, with my parents and my father and my brother. And um, it has a real resonance, not only uh, because of the work that's been done here and the famous people that have been here and uh, the incredible responsibility I feel that we need to save this place for future generations. And as you look around, there are literally hundreds of kids here in the park today. Um, but this is also this very visible connection with Italy. Yeah. Um, Beaux-Arts, as, as uh, you know, uh, evokes um, ancient Rome and ancient Greece. But right here, uh, we have a fountain, um, the fountain, the Italian fountain it's called, which is from Como, Italy. Uh, the fountain was given to us by the Rockefellers. In a classic Italian story, the uh, city of Como built a beautiful fountain for Piazza Cavour. The fountain, unfortunately, when they put it in, lowered the water pressure in the town. So therefore, there were many people that were against the fountain because they couldn't get water in their homes. So then it became the Fontanista and the Antifontanista. And the Antifontanista won. So the city of Como literally took the fountain apart, put it into the basement of the municipio, of City Hall, and there come the Rockefellers. They purchased it purportedly for $450, oh shipped it to New York, and gave it to the Bronx Zoo as a gift. And therefore, we have one of the few, if I think the only, Italian public fountain on display 
in New York City. Every once in a while, I'll get a letter from Como, Italy, asking, you know, can we get the fountain back? <laughs> and I literally will call and say, well, we just did a, a $1.4 million renovation, renovation of the fountain. <laughs> if you want to take it, it'll probably cost you several million dollars. And then the calls stop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then, right next to that fountain, which is, by, by the way, next to a planted uh, formal Italian garden, um, there are actually, there's a little fountain there, a little a public drinking fountain. Um, a hidraulico, a plumber, during World War II, lands in Anzio, goes to Pompeii, and takes a piece of clay pipe from the ancient fountain of youth in Pompeii. Inexplicably brings it back to New York and gives it to the Bronx Zoo. He was a huge Bronxite, loved the Bronx Zoo. We, in 1953, had a formal um, a ceremony with representatives from the Italian government um, and we put this fountain, this piece of clay pipe down. So the fountain still works. Um, the, the detto, the story, uh, is that if you drink from that fountain you will be forever young. You so go. not only will you learn <laughs> about the natural world, you can probably pick up a couple of extra years just by coming to the Bronx Zoo. That's fabulous. And, uh, and these pieces of, yeah. of my Italian heritage yeah. Um, I park my car there every day, so I kind of look up and I see this amazing, beautiful fountain, um, I, this gorgeous park, this Beaux-Arts structure, and I realize that what we've done here is really created that virtual, but not vir we've really created that link between um, the past and, and the present and the future. It's our sort of Villa Borghese here. Villa right? Borghese. <laughs> and, and the beauty of it, just like Villa Borghese, yeah. it's for the public. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. is one of the great things about New York, right. that you have public institutions, you are, you are on a public land, and these are public buildings run by a private organization uh, on behalf of the people of New York. And that is the great experiment that was and is New York. Um, places like the American Museum of Natural History, the, the uh, Bronx Botanical Garden, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There's so many examples, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. All of these are this expression of a city that wanted to become world class, mm -hmm. but also wanted to give real valuable educational amenities and social amenities to the people of the city. And uh, I don't know what I could do more with my life than yeah. to be back in the Bronx, back in my home borough, but really helping to uh, maintain and support these incredible institutions that bring millions of New Yorkers pleasure uh, every year. And you're involved in some very important campaigns in your So we work um, literally throughout Africa and Asia um, and uh, Latin America. And uh, one of the things that our scientists had really realized was that there has been a complete decimation of the, eye, of the elephant um, population. I mean, we're talking about 1.2 million elephants in 1980. There's less than 400,000 now. Uh, they are being killed at the rate of about 9 to 10 percent a year. Mm. So within our lifetime, there will be no elephants in the wild. And this is all for the ivory. What's happening is the ivory is being used for ornamental purposes right. in China, in Thailand, in South Asia, but also here in the United States. And the United States is actually, uh, in, by some estimates, the second largest market for ivory in the oh. world. On 58th Street, there are literally two stores next to each other yes. that are selling whole tusks. Yes. So working with uh, Secretary Clinton and, and the daughter Chelsea uh, initially and you know, kind of raising this issue, we worked through the Clinton Global Initiative and had 11 African countries and seven African heads of state came last year to say to the West, uh, please stop buying ivory. Now, why is this ivory uh, so bad? Well, first of all, there's this kind of biological, ecological disaster that's happening on the ground. But the ivory is actually being used by terrorist groups in Africa to fund their to fund activities. Their activities yeah. So um, there is um, ample evidence at this point that Al-Shabaab and the John Juid and the Lord's Resistance Army are all using ivory in some way, shape, or form. It's called bush currency. When we were a bit younger, it was in West Africa and it was blood ivory. Now it's blood diamonds. We really kind of took that call from the African leaders and we created something called 96 Elephants. Now why 96 Elephants? It's a campaign. Every day in Africa, 96 elephants are killed. It's 35,000 a year. So every 15 minutes is an elephant killed. And we wanted to educate people about it. We wanted to put a ban on the sale of ivory, at least for 10 years, so these populations can rebound. And uh, we wanted to try to do something on the ground, have the funds necessary 
for um, purposes of working to uh, stop these nefarious groups and improve their law enforcement on the ground in Africa. So um, in a year, we now have 168 organizations in 41 states. Um, we've been able to get over 650,000 emails to elected officials around the country. And uh, we passed uh, an ivory ban in New York and in New Jersey. And there are 15 other states now that are working on similar legislation. Yeah, well, I wanted to pick up on the, the issue about the laws, because you're, you're telling me that this state and that state are prohibited. But I thought there was sort of a national law about it. But yet you're saying there are these two stores on 58th Street. And I know those stores because I walk by them a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. So what happened is there was an international ban on ivory put in place in 1990. And um, it basically says that any, any ivory before 1990 uh, can be sold, but anything, any animal that was killed after 1990, that elephant ivory cannot be sold. Here's the problem. You can't tell ivory from <laughs> 1995, from 1895. Yeah. So therefore, what happens is you have unscrupulous dealers and you have unscrupulous individuals, and what they say is, oh, this is pre-1990, and they'll and just sign no way you can, and you and can't tell. No way you can well, actually, that. you could tell if you destroyed a piece of the ivory. And, have ran, and, ran, and then ran, ran it through, through radiocarbon right. testing. Here's right. the problem with that. An elephant will live 60 years. So the you may get the piece at the end, which is 60 years old, but the elephant may have been killed yesterday. Yeah. So therefore, at the end of the day, it's literally impossible to test this. So what we're pushing for is really you have to use only antique ivory. It has to be 100 years or older, and you need to have documentation to show that it is yeah. older ivory. Yeah. One of the great things for us is we, all school groups in New York City can come here for free. Um, public, private, parochial, uh, it doesn't matter to us. We, we see ourselves as an educational institution and that we need to be a laboratory for these kids. And coming to the zoo is one of those great experiences where, yes, you could see the animals, but there's a lot of history to learn, geography, you could use it for math. There's so many different ways. And one of the great things that we've done is we partnered with Urban Assembly and we actually have a small school called the Urban Assembly School for Wildlife Conservation oh. here, and then the Rachel Carson School for Marine Studies out in Brooklyn, and they are our partners with our institutions. And uh, we had our first graduating class uh, last year. Oh, wonderful. Uh, very That's excited. Yeah. And um, all of the uh, students uh, that wanted to go have gone to college. So um, our numbers are actually relatively impressive compared to other parts of the city, and it's in the South Bronx. It's literally on 178th <laughs> Street. This. And you know what? What that tells you yeah. is it doesn't really matter. If you give kids yeah. what they need, they can succeed. We're in the Bronx. We'll bring it back to the yeah. Italian-American. The whole discussions about the Little Italy's are disappearing. Yeah. People will tell you that the Little Italy in Manhattan is by now a theme yeah. park. Yeah. It's a, a amusement park yeah. right, where you go and eat your cannoli, whatever. But Arthur Avenue, which is the old working class Italian neighborhood, as old as immigration, right, 140 years old, has come back, and it's yeah. come back in a very authentic way, hasn't it? I am completely and utterly biased in this conversation, so I want to preface <laughs> any comments I make about a, right, either the Bronx yeah. or about Arthur Avenue yeah. with that statement. Arthur Avenue, I think, is probably one of the last authentic Little Italy's in New York City. I know that there are many others, but I can only speak about what I know personally. And what Arthur Avenue has been able to do is maintain that authenticity because there is still an Italian-American community here to some extent, but also there's this sense of ritorno, of return. So many of the businesses are third, fourth, fifth generation Italian-American. I mean, we are going to be in the next, I would say next five years, celebrating at least three or four businesses that are over 100 years old. Wow. So, you know, Madonia Brothers, yeah. Egidio's, Tidal Brothers. I always love the fact that we have probably some of the, um, the best marketing people uh, on Arthur Avenue, and they're all uh, little old Italian people because yeah. they know how to market their product. You know why? Because it's a genuine product. Yeah. What we're trying to do also, though, is to in infuse more of our culture and, and language. There was recently Rex Hall was just uh, restored. Rex Hall is this little jewel of a spot where Enrico Caruso came to sing 100 years ago. And uh, there's still, what do we do with this space? We don't want to lose it. Ferragosto, which is the celebration of our uh, end of summer. End of summer. Uh, and we do that in, uh, in mid-September, which of course is not when Ferragosto is, right. but, but, you know, but August, it's, you know, it's a, it can't be right. the 15th of right. August. None of us would be here. Right. Many of us are either at the beach or, or, in, or, Italy. or in Italy, right? <laughs> 
Um, so Ferragosto is another opportunity to celebrate yeah. our Italian heritage and culture with Puccinella and all these other elements of our culture that have been forgotten for the little kids, as well as the music and the food, etc. And if people want to get some information, they go to the Enrico Fermi Library, Library. which has an absolutely yes. fabulous yeah. collection of books in Italian and about Italy. We have an opportunity for Rinascimento. I hate using Renaissance. I mean, it was we were the Rinascimento. Yes, we created, we why do we use here. the French word? Yes, we should use exactly. the Italian word, Rinascimento. Right. And there's this moment here where I think people are looking for something. And I, I want to go back to that documentary. That documentary gives you the sense of, I want to know more. And part of that discovery is coming back to these little Italy's. I look at them as portals to the past and to the future. They can be a place where you can reconnect with that immigrant experience, but how do we use them to tell them about Italy today and what's happening in Italy yeah. today? And how do, you know, how do we make sure that we don't lose that connection? And my hope is um, if you go to San Diego, the Little Italy in San Diego has done incredible work in helping to bridge that gap. How? Mixed use housing bringing young people back into that community. Mm -hmm. Right here, I think why Arthur Avenue has so much potential even to grow further is you've got the Bronx Zoo, you've got the Botanical Garden, literally right at its doorstep, and then you have Fordham University. Right. And Fordham University has now really become very much of a national school. Many of the kids are living off campus where they're living on Arthur right. Avenue. Right. And yeah. there's a sense of vitality that comes with young people. And uh, you walk down the street, and you're going to hear many different languages, and then you're going to hear the, the Neapolitan trying to sell you the best oranges or the best uh -huh. uh, tomatoes. Yeah. Um, so it's a great place to come uh, with your family, and if you go to Fordham and you're uh, trying to get your child into the school, the school will literally tell you, if you've got a little bit of free time, go over to Arthur Avenue and have a wonderful meal. Well, on that, well, thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, and welcome, and thank you for coming. It's our pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this special episode of Italics. For more information on Italian Heritage and Culture Month events, go to italyculturemonth.org. Tune in to our next Italian Heritage and Culture Month special, airing October 23rd. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata. Everybody start to sing la di da ho 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 Now you're singing with a swing Do 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 do